Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the final day of our medical devices webinar series. My name is James Gilroy. I'm uh, one of the medical officers at medical devices in the HBRA, uh, and it's a pleasure to have you here with us this morning. Many of you have us, uh, many of you have probably joined us earlier in the week and um, when we covered some of the key practical implementation issues that we felt would be of value to you as our key stakeholders. And, and it's sort of based on common questions that we receive on a daily basis here in the HBRA. I uh, hope you're finding the sessions useful. Um, just a, a, a point at the start, we are recording the sessions. Uh, we hope to have them on, available on our website shortly once we finish some post-production. So uh, today's, uh, we're going to be discussing the clinical requirements uh, of the MDR, in particular the issue of sufficient clinical data and equivalence for legacy devices. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Tom Melvin, um, and he will be giving us uh, an overview um, of those, those topics. He'll also be giving us an overview of the CIE um, work package for 2021, the CIE being the Clinical Investigation and Evaluation uh, Working Group uh, at the European Commission level. Once again, we're going to be requesting feedback on the presentations uh, and the webinar series at the end of today's sessions, and I'll provide the code for that later on. Um, many thanks for the feedback that we've received so far uh, that's gone on to tailor how we do the, the subsequent webinars uh, and we'll also go into tailor how we present information uh, in the future on our website, etc. Um, before I hand over to Tom today, uh, I'd like to remind you of some of the housekeeping rules for this event. Um, as an attendee, you'll be able to listen, um, but you will not be able to speak uh, or turn on your cameras. Uh, you will be able to ask questions in the Q&A tab visible in, uh, on the toolbar in the top right hand corner. Um, we are expecting a large number of participants today, so we're conscious that we may not get to ask your specific question. We have time at the end, as you see, for questions and answers, and we will be looking to take uh, some of the more broad reaching questions that can answer sort of multiple questions at the same time. Um, and where we aren't able to get to specific questions, we will be using those questions to tailor uh, information that we, we present uh, in future newsletters and future website updates, etc. In this, in this webinar, we're going to run the two presentations back to back uh, and then take questions at the end. So without further delay, delighted to welcome our, our speaker for today, Dr. Tom Melvin. Tom is the clinical manager here in the HPRA. Um, he leads up the clinical team um, and he's also co-chair uh, of the clinical investigation and evaluation working group uh, at, at the European Commission level. Um, so Tom is, is really a national and, and an international expert on the topic of clinical uh, aspects of medical device regulation overall. Uh, so really looking forward to the session. So over to you, Tom. Um, thank you very much, James, uh, for the kind introduction and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, um, albeit remotely. Um, and as James has mentioned, what I'd like to do today in the two sessions we have and the hour available um, is to talk through in the first session uh, what we call sufficient clinical evidence and equivalence for legacy devices. Um, in session two, we're going to discuss a little bit about the forthcoming CIE work program. And we also have a little uh, bit of information and some slides on the HPRA clinical investigation process. What are the current supports? And, and what will be coming in the future for MDR, and that's based on some of the mentee feedback from earlier in the week. Um, so I guess without further ado, we'll go into the agenda for session one. Um, so we'll give a little bit of introduction and context to medical devices and how they're uh, regulated from uh, the clinical perspective. Then we'll dive into the two MDCG guidance documents, explain some of the detail, the scope, um, and how they can uh, help uh, manufacturers come into MDR compliance. And we have a couple of concluding remarks. Uh, so just by way of introduction, um, I guess there's a range of differences when you consider medicinal products and medical devices um, in terms of the regulatory system. But I guess when you consider the technologies, um, two of the things that can be quite prominent um, is the fact that we have a huge number of medical devices um, in our system in Europe. It runs to the hundreds of thousands, um, whereas with drugs we have uh, numbers that run to the tens of thousands. And I guess the second thing that's really important when we think about medical devices and a regulation is that iteration uh, so making small changes to a product over time uh, is something that happens routinely with medical devices and is far less prominent with medicinal products. Um, and this is often an important consideration when we talk about uh, the medical device life cycle. Um, so I guess these are two important things to remember by way of introduction. Um, in this next slide, I guess this is just a snapshot of some of the important differences when we think of how clinical evidence is generated for both medicinal products and medical devices. 
Uh, when we think about the clinical development phases, um, I guess many of us will be aware now um, from COVID as well as lots of media things about the standardized approach to drug development. So we've all probably heard about phase three studies for vaccines, etc. So medicinal products have a highly standard uh, method of uh, clinical evidence generation. With medical devices, it's less standardized. Um, However, there are some important improvements that have been made to the system, both with MDR and a generally increased requirement for clinical investigation data, but also with um, guidance documents and ISO standards. For example, the newly revised ISO 14155 um, from earlier this year um, has clinical development phasing now as an important consideration uh, for study design. Um, but I guess it's also product de um, dependent and for lower risk products that may not need a, a phased approach necessarily. Um, with respect to the actual design of the study, um, again, it's highly standardized in the medicinal product world where we have double blind randomized controlled trials um, as a routine. Uh, with medical devices, this is often less standardized and often for necessary reasons where blinding and, and randomizing uh, uh, subjects in a study can be difficult for practical reasons. Um, we often see one sided observational studies. Um, so in general, it's a less standardized um, clinical study design setting. Uh, <clears throat> The next item in this table I think is a really important one from the public health perspective and it's the fact that irreversible effects on study subjects is something that is thankfully rare with uh, medicinal products but it can be something that you can quite commonly see um, and especially with um, high risk uh, implantable devices um, with critical function uh, things like valves, stents, etc. Um, and oftentimes these devices once placed are irretrievable uh, and this means that the oversight of the safety of these products um, is very important. And finally, I guess an important difference um, when we think of drugs and devices that the types of organizations engaged in research can be uh, somewhat different. Uh, with medicinal products, usually quite large organizations. With medical devices, our ecosystem often includes lots of small or medium sized enterprises um, investigating products. Um, we've had a lot of discussion uh, throughout this week on different changes that MDR brings and I guess it's not possible with the time available to go into complete detail about all the changes from a clinical perspective that MDR will bring but I guess in this slide we'll hopefully present just a snapshot of some of the important changes. Um, common specifications are an important new um, rule in MDR that allow the creation of specific rules uh, for clinical or technical aspects of medical devices. Um, the scrutiny procedure or clinical evaluation consultation procedure um, is a new type of procedure that will involve the use of experts and we have uh, one or two slides later in the presentation to explain a little bit more about the current implementation status of these expert panels. Um, equivalence is something that we'll discuss in more detail later on but I guess at the start it's important to note that uh, the detail regarding equivalence is now brought into law for the first time. It had previously been in uh, guidance documents and med dev documents. Uh, in Annex 14 of MDR now you'll see um, all of the characteristics and individual criteria for the clinical, technical, biological aspects of equivalence. Um, in terms of the methodology for clinical evaluation, there's also more detail um, in MDR and there's aspects such as justifying the level of evidence or considering alternatives. And I guess these methodology principles have more detail in the MDCG guidance documents that we'll go on to talk about in a couple of slides. Um, Transparency is a really important goal of MDR and one of the first guidance documents we produced for MDR from the CIE working group um, was what's called the summary of safety and clinical performance and this will be a standard template of information regarding the clinical evidence to support high risk devices and hopefully this will be a useful reference point in future. And I guess finally as a general requirement the uh, clinical evidence requirements for high risk products have increased and I guess the rules for claiming equivalence for high risk products have increased also. Uh, so I guess these are a summary of some of the important changes. Um, what I'd like to do now in this next section is move into two of the MDCG guidance documents that were prepared at the CIE working group uh, and published in the last year. Uh, so we're going to introduce these now. Um, you'll see here the cover page from the two documents. Um, so this is MDCG 2025 and 6. Um, you'll see, uh, I guess as a general point, that the guidance documents for MDR, MDR are called MDCG uh, guidance documents. We used to call uh, guidance documents MedDevs, um, and many people will be familiar with that. Um, and you can find these on the European Commission website. So I guess the two we're going to talk about today um, is the guidance for equivalence and for what we often call sufficient clinical data, or you'll see in the title there, clinical evidence needed for medical devices, previously CE marked. Um, so I guess in terms of these two guides, what's the purpose of them? 
So I guess these two guides were written um, to help manufacturers and notified bodies to prepare for conformity assessment for MDR, um, specifically for legacy products. Um, and I guess one of the important things with equivalence is that the guidance has uh, both a gap analysis and a table. Um, so you'll see the equivalence guide runs to 20 odd pages. And I guess one of the rationales for requiring a specific guidance for equivalence was that the previous consensus guidance um, containing equivalence information was in something called MedDev 271 Revision 4. And at the same time that that was being drafted, um, the similar MDR provisions <clears throat> in Annex 14 were being drafted, and this led to two documents that had slight differences. So we needed to accommodate and explain um, how people should approach those differences, and we also provided a standardized table uh, in the document. So I guess in terms of some of the information you can expect, so you'll see legacy devices are not defined in MDR, but they are defined for the first time um, in the MDCG uh, 2026 document. And this is a, a summary from that definition, but the essential components are that any device previously CE marked under the medical device or active implantable directive. Um, as well as that definition, there's a range of further definitions that will hopefully be helpful. Um, we have definitions for well-established technology, scientific validity, at uh, the level of clinical evidence, and what is a similar device. And these will all hopefully be helpful for manufacturers approaching uh, the MDR requirements. I guess it's also important to consider what isn't included in these guidances. Um, so this isn't a comprehensive methodology for all products. Um, at the CIE working group, we looked at uh, doing an update to the MedDev 271 revision 4, um, but it was deemed that it wouldn't be possible with the time available before the date of application to do that. So this isn't a comprehensive methodology, but these two guidance documents show you the, the still relevant parts of guidance, uh, such as from MedDev 271 revision 4 that can still apply. Um, I guess there are some aspects that aren't um, covered in the guidances either, so I guess um, the contract requirements for high risk products uh, for equivalence um, don't have detailed guidance in them. And I guess, as I mentioned, one of the primary goals with the equivalence guide was to provide a, a gap analysis. Um, so I guess what is the kind of information that is covered? Um, you'll see in MDCG uh, 2026, the Sufficient Clinical Data Guide, that it shows some of the important changes. So it introduces them, explains them, and provides a little bit of guidance as to what are the important elements that have been brought in. And this covers things such as considering alternative available treatments um, and some of the points we mentioned earlier. Um, one of the important things in terms of consistency um, is that uh, this MDCG guide helps to show the parts from current guidance for the directives that are still applicable and can still be used. And you'll see in an annex to the MDCG um, 6 guide, um, you'll see the start parts of the MedDev that are still applicable. And it also tries to harmonize with um, what we call the stepwise approach in MedDev 271 revision 4. And the stepwise approach essentially is a stepwise methodology for creating your clinical evaluation. It's um, the identification, appraisal, analysis, etc. So it's it's written in such a way that it will harmonize with the current methodology. Um, so I guess just in terms of a couple of concluding slides, I guess it's important to remember that the key components um, regarding um, the MDR and clinical investigations, clinical data, etc., are all still the same. But I guess it is important to be aware of some of the differences um, that MDR brings. Uh, for example, the definition of clinical data has changed, and that's an important thing to think about. Um, so it's really important to look at the detail of MDR. Um, we'll explain a couple of concluding um, uh, points in the next slide, um, some of the things to be aware of. Um, but the key components of how clinical data works um, are, are still the same. But I guess it's really important um, and for anyone preparing for MDR compliance to remember that because you are um, compliant to the directives, that doesn't give you an automatic presumption of conformity. Or I guess the phrase we sometimes use is that there's no grandfathering. So just because you have a CE mark for the directive doesn't give you an automatic presumption. But it does mean that you will have done a lot of preparatory work that will bring you a long ways towards compliance. Um, I guess a point that we've been making um, for some time now in HPRA is that Planning for compliance to MDR requirements and especially the clinical requirements in Chapter 6 um, mean that you should really go in and look at your clinical evaluation um, to see what gaps there may be. Um, MDR brings a series of new processes and requirements. You'll see new different types of plans that will also apply. 
So I guess it's important to be aware of these and to map these out as to how you'll approach it from a processor or quality perspective. And if you do have clinical data gaps, looking at how that can be um, uh, filled by doing things like post-market clinical follow-up studies is a really important thing. And I guess all the more important given that the time until the date of application um, is some short months. Um, so I guess in the final summary point there, you'll see that the key concepts remain but it is really important to be aware of the new requirements, the new processes and the new types of conclusions that you may have to find um, as a result of clinical evaluation. And I guess that's especially the case for high risk devices. Um, so I guess we'll maybe defer to questions until the end of the two presentations. Um, I might just hand back briefly to James for a couple of uh, comments on the first session and then we can move into session two. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, very helpful overview of, of that specific guidance and, and I suppose it's worth also highlighting uh, to participants on, on the webinar that um, the site where you'll find that specific those two specific guidances from the Commission contains really a lot of guidance from the Commission that's been published over the past six months and um, there's been really a lot of excellent work going on um, and if you haven't yet sort of accessed that resource um, we would encourage you to do that because a lot of the questions you may have um, may be answered there. We do see that there is a question there about um, some audio problems. Uh, apologies for that if you're experiencing some audio problems um, with us here uh, in the, the central system. It seems to be working OK, so possibly if you if you dial out and, and join back in, um, there'll be a few more minutes before Tom begins his second session, so that will hopefully work for anyone who's struggling with the, the audio issues. As I said at the start, Tom is the clinical manager in the HPRA um, and manages the clinical team, um, but he wears multiple hats. Um, and one of the other hats that he wears uh, is as co-chair of the, the CIE working group. Um, and the CIE working group has been uh, very, very active over the past number of years, um, focusing on all of these uh, issues to do with the clinical implementation of the MDR and these aspects. Um, and as I say, a lot of the guidance has now been published uh, on the Commission website. Um, and the CIA has now taken a proactive look towards what the next uh, next uh, period of time will hold in terms of looking for outputs. Um, so we're, we're very lucky to have Tom as the co-chair of, of that working group here to present to us this morning as well on um, what might be coming from the CIA working group over the next uh, year or so. So I'll hand back to Tom, thanks. Thank you, James. Um, and exactly, I guess at the CIA working group, we have been quite busy. Um, what I'd like to do in session two is, I guess, to explain um, what we're hoping to do over the coming year um, at the CIE working group, um, what are the kind of goals we're looking to achieve, um, and what are the kind of work packages that we've defined. Um, we're quite lucky in that it was just last week that we had our CIE working group meeting. Um, we bought a draft work program for endorsement, um, happy to announce that we did manage to endorse that work program. Um, so we're now at the stage where a lot of the short term deliverables for system supports for MDR implementation uh, will begin. What I'd like to do in this session is explain um, those work packages, where they've come from and what we're planning to do. Uh, and then at the end of uh, that part, we also have a couple of slides, as I mentioned, on the clinical investigation supports we have in HPRA. So I guess these are the items we look to introduce. Um, who are we at CIE and what do we do? Um, our work program and what's the detail and a couple of other uh, clinical policy updates that we discussed at the working group last week. Um, so I guess just to introduce who the working group is. Um, so the CIE working group is part of uh, 13 working groups we have for uh, the medical device regulation. They're European Commission working groups. Uh, we typically had what we used to call face-to-face -face meetings twice per year. Um, so the most recent one was last week and the last two meetings we've had have been electronic now. Um, it, most working groups have a commission as well as a member state chair. So um, I chair from the member state perspective and I co-chair with Paul Piscoy from the European Commission. Um, at the meetings themselves, we have plenary or open sessions, and this is where um, it's really useful to hear from stakeholders. We've got a wide variety of stakeholders at the CIA working group, and we uh, typically invite them to present on topics relevant to our work. And then we have a closed session where the member states come together to discuss clinical policy and plans, as well as try to reach consensus on work. Um, Something we started in recent years at CIE uh, was a monthly teleconference uh, to help with coordination, and that's been really useful in light of the pressures of MDR implementation work. And um, so we meet monthly to coordinate as member states and to uh, plan and prepare and progress with work. Um, I'll introduce some of the work packages. We have eight new work packages at CIE, and um, each of them have, um, I guess, terms of reference uh, for the individual work. Um, for our work 
uh, group as a whole um, across all uh, Commission working groups there's published terms of reference you'll find them on the Commission website that shows our, our rules of conduct etc um, and I guess it's important to remember from a procedural perspective um, once the CIE working group endorses a document it then goes on to the MDCG and that's the medical device coordination group so this is a um, body uh, bound in legislation in MDR and um, that's given the formal task of endorsing documents before they come official MDCG guidance documents. Um, this is a, a screen grab from the part of the Commission web page that James mentioned. So there's currently over 70 guidance documents that the Commission have been working on for MDR implementation. And at the CIE working group, um, we have seven guidance documents published. Um, and you can see them here on the list in front of us. And I might just take a minute or two to walk through each of them and introduce what they are. Um, so I guess starting from the bottom, uh, they're in chronological order. Um, the very first document we published was on summary of safety and clinical performance. That was in August 2019. Um, that's a detailed and hopefully useful document that shows the kind of approach a manufacturer should have for completing the summary of safety and clinical performance. And it also includes a template um, at the end. Um, the next two documents, um, five and six, are the ones that we discussed in the last session, so I won't say too much more about them. Um, the next two documents are two templates, and these are important for post-market planning. So we have a PMCF plan and a PMCF evaluation report. Uh, and I guess these are standardized templates um, for MDR compliance, and uh, they also have some, I guess, additional information within the template, which will hopefully help to guide. Um, the next one is our SAE, um, MedDev Guidance, and I guess this is the first in what will hopefully be a series of MDCG documents um, that we're producing at CIE as part of our Udemed contingency. Um, as many people will be aware, the Udemed system being developed for MDR is going to be subject to delays, and um, we do need um, standard templates that meet MDR requirements, um, but we'll work outside of that um, platform uh, for next May. Um, so this is essentially an update of what colleagues will have remembered was the SAE MedDev, um, and it has guidance as well as a template um, it's quite similar to that MedDev guidance, but there are some new procedural rules in MDR that we had to accommodate. Um, and this is what will come into effect for next May uh, for SE reporting for clinical investigations. Um, then I guess the last and most recent uh, document published from July was the CEAR uh, template. Uh, this is a really important one and it's the first time we've standardized a CEAR template in Europe. A uh, clinical evaluation assessment report is the name for the template uh, that a notified body completes when they review the clinical evidence and clinical evaluation for a product. Um, it's one that was quite a large undertaking of work because it was relevant to quite a few commission directorates because it supports um, other procedures such as the scrutiny procedure as well particular um, uh, articles in MDR for different types of um, products. For example, Article 6110 uh, has uh, rules for medical devices where clinical data is not deemed appropriate. And we have uh, covered, I guess, a number of different conformity routes um, by the CEA or template. So it's a it's an important one and I guess it has lots of detail in it. There's a little bit of guidance at the top of that template also. So I encourage people who are interested to check that one out also. Um, so I guess moving on then, uh, what I'd like to do in the next couple of slides is to introduce our work programme. So this is what we endorsed uh, last week at CIE uh, and the eight work packages that we mentioned. And I guess this is a screen grab of how we try as member states to get onto a single page in terms of agreeing uh, where our priorities need to lie. Um, and one of the important jobs as chair at the working group along with Paul is that we've been planning since the summer for the different work packages and where we need to focus and where we need to prioritize. And it's using documents like this that we take um, suggestions from all the member states and then we come together to discuss, prioritize and then um, agree on the work program. Um, and I guess in the next two slides, what I'd like to do is explain each of those work items. Uh, what kind of work are we looking to do and what kind of timelines are we looking at? Um, so I guess the way we divided it up was for work package 10 to 15. These are called short term deliverables or Udemed contingencies. And these are essentially the system needs that we're going to have to try to address before next May. So these often have um, somewhat expedited timelines associated with them. The first one, Work Package 10, is looking at clinical investigation application templates. Um, we have prepared templates um, for the Udemed development team, um, but we will need standalone templates. So we already have a lot of work in the background and we just need to agree on a standard template that will be standalone, as well as consider how the best format would be for this type of template. And we're thinking of things such as a PDF with XML integrated that might help have standard data fields that might support um, the use of that data. And if future. Um, 
The next work package is the clinical investigation assessment template. So this would be something that the member states use for assessing clinical investigation applications. Um, this is one that is not likely to be delivered until later next year, um, but it is hopefully going to be a very important template and it will support things um, such as the Article 78 coordinated assessments of clinical investigations. Um, the next one concerns a clinical investigation report summary template. Um, so people who are aware of some of the uh, clinical investigation report requirements in MDR will be aware that the clinical investigation report and the summary need to be publicly available. And I guess for clinical investigation reports that are complete, um, Annex D of the newly revised 14155 standard um, has lots of detail about the full report. Um, I guess what we're looking to do <clears throat> is to provide some guidance for that summary report um, because both need to be made public. And in the case of a summary report, it needs to be understandable to the user of the device, which in some cases will be a layperson. Um, so there is a little bit of policy work to do with that one. Um, work package 13 concerns a questions and answers guidance document that we've been working on for about a year now at the CIE working group. Um, so this isn't a new work package, but we bought it in and, and gave it a number because it wasn't part of the uh, work program that we previously agreed. The work is reasonably mature. There's about 20 odd questions and answers that we're working on um, and we'll hopefully push that out uh, in the early part of next year. Um, work package 14 is part of ongoing work that's been ongoing um, for some years now and this is how the CIE working group work with the Udemed MDCG <coughs> subgroup. So I guess this is an ongoing support work item and part of the way that we've looked at that is to see how do we ensure that we can provide regular support so we can bring a consensus view of member states at CIE to support questions that may arise from you to med development. Um, work package 15 then is I guess building upon the current MDCG guidance where we have a guidance and template for SAEs and this is more for member states um, to um, achieve consensus on how we'll manage SAEs and again this will be in the absence of Udemed where we'll probably be relying on things like um, either email or things like Udemed 2 so we just simply need to agree how we will work in terms of the analysis and also the formats but I guess it's a much more member state fo focused work package. Um, in this next table, I guess these concern what we call other work packages where um, it's either part of ongoing support work or work that doesn't have the same uh, pressures of time in terms of bringing deliverables. So to go through each of them briefly, work package 16 concerns common specifications and I mentioned these at the start. These are the new type of rules that MDR provides for. Um, so at the CIE working group for five years now, believe it or not, we've been working on a revision to current MedDev guidance for coronary stents um, and it started as what was called device specific guidance um, but because MDR is now approaching it's going to be translated into a common specification for coronary stents um, and I guess there's a second part to this work package also um, and this is looking at how do we build a sustainable system for taking products or product groups which may require common specifications in future. Um, so there's already a lot of background work done for that um, and people who um, have been following um, medical device implementation and, and uh, initiatives at the CAMD group would be aware that there was something called JAMS, the Joint Action and Market Surveillance Work. Ireland led a work package on helping to define a prioritisation table. Um, so I guess we'll uh, use this work package to help further some work in that area. Um, work package 17 is an example of ongoing support work and it concerns the topic of transparency and an important goal of MDR. Um, and I guess this is going to be relevant in the coming months for things such as Udemed development, where we'll have to work with the Udemed development team to identify what data fields should, as a general rule, be public or not. Um, so that's how we uh, cloak it in this work package 17, but it is a support role and is supportive of other work packages that are ongoing. Um, and then finally, work package 18 is one that we uh, deferred and didn't manage to set um, a clear scope for, uh, but we will continue to uh, work on developing a scope for this work package. And it's looking at proportionate clinical investigation and evaluation requirements for medical devices falling under Article 616B. Uh, and colleagues may be aware that Article 616B is a list of about 11 medical device products that are quite simple um, and it allows for an exception from general clinical investigation requirements for things such as plates, pins, wedges, etc. Um, so I guess just simply down to the fact that we have limited resources, we can't start all of these work packages at the same time. So that's one more further scope is needed and the timeline uh, will be defined in the new year. Um, I guess 
it also be useful to maybe give a couple of other brief updates on some of the other policy work at CIE Working Group. I guess this is a slide and the next three slides um, are taken from the European Society of Cardiology update to CIE last week. Um, <clears throat> I thought this was a nice slide because it shows in a way how the expert panels will work in future. Um, expert panels uh, under um, Article 54 or what's colloquially called scrutiny uh, will be a new procedure where independent clinical experts in Europe will review uh, novel and high risk devices after they've completed their clinical evaluation assessment by a notified body. Uh, the process is defined in MDR and are set timelines. Um, for example, if the um, expert group do not want to deliver opinion, they have 20 days to make that decision. And as a result of that and the quite uh, short timelines, um, there's both screening panels and you'll see an example of one here on the right, and there's also specialty uh, panels um, and the example given here is the um, circulatory system panel um, so a lot of cardiovascular products but you can see how there's a, a nice complement of different uh, expert groupings uh, to support that general um, specialism. Um, so I guess this is work where from what I understand the European Commission have been engaging in training for all of the experts uh, to explain how the process works, what's expected, how the timelines work and so on um, and I guess People may also be aware that um, just in recent days there's been a, um, a proposal made by the European Commission um, that the directorate or agency responsible for running these in future may be the European Medicines Agency, um, but this is a very early stage in proposal for a regulation. Um, another important thing to mention is a H2020, so this is European funding for clinical research. Um, there was a funding call uh, put out last year um, for clinical methodology for medical devices um, and I'm very happy to announce that on the 23rd of October um, a group called CoreMD um, and this is led by the Biomed Alliance um, which is a group in Europe that brings in over 30 different clinical associations. Um, so the Biomed Alliance, um, working with EFORT and the European Society of Cardiology, um, won a funding round to begin work um, that will hopefully begin in uh, April of next year. Um, HPRA is part of this consortium and in the next couple of slides we'll introduce the, the kind of actors and the kind of deliverables um, that this work will bring. You can see here and um, this shows you I guess um, the various different groups who will be involved. Um, so we have uh, European uh, clinical associations. We also have the European Patients Forum, so there will be patient representatives with a number of academic institutions as well as uh, regulators, uh, public health uh, bodies, health technology assessment bodies and notified bodies, um, all part of this work package. Um, so it, it's a great collection of people and it, it, to be um, honest, it's a really interesting looking uh, work package that has been put together. Um, this is just one slide to show the kind of deliverables that we're um, expecting. There's going to be five work packages here uh, in HPRA, along with the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. We're hoping to lead work package one, and this is essentially looking at the type of methodologies used currently uh, for high risk medical devices for market entry. Um, so that's called work package one. I won't go through all the detail of the other work packages, um, but I guess essentially we're going to look at existing methods, then looking at new methods, real world data and how to build better networks in Europe. Uh, work package five then is a coordination work package, but again it's very interesting work and I think it has really great potential. Um, in the final couple of slides I'd like to maybe just explain some of the current and future supports planned in HPRA for clinical investigations in Ireland. Um, so in this first slide, I guess explaining some of the current supports we have, um, one of the things that we've built upon um, in the last couple of years in HPRA is how do we um, support sponsors of clinical studies and it doesn't matter if you're a very early stage startup spin out um, company um, who doesn't know very much about regulation, we're very happy to meet, explain how regulation works, explain how the clinical investigation process works uh, and essentially help people um, along that development pathway. We call that preliminary meetings um, where we're happy to explain the regulatory system, provide um, references to relevant guidance or standards, etc. Um, <clears throat> for study sponsors who have a submission that's essentially there or thereabouts, we have something called pre-submission meetings and this is a really good way for HPRA colleagues as well as the study sponsors to come together to get a real understanding of the protocol, the product, the technology uh, and to discuss any um, small outstanding issues that there might be um, prior to a submission coming in and essentially it's a really good um, opportunity for us all to understand the product in a uh, more colloquial manner uh, where we get to see the technology, sometimes put our hands on the technology um, as well as understand the study and protocol. Um, 
A third thing that's also important um, for people developing new products is that we have an innovation office in HPRA, and this runs across departments and the medical products that we regulate. Um, essentially, anyone with an innovative medical product can uh, send a query to the innovation office, and if it's related to a medical device, it'll be passed on to our team and will help to support with providing guidance um, for those products. Um, and then finally, for people who have general queries, um, they can always contact devices at hpra.ie and we'll try to help wherever we can. Um, just I guess finally then on some of the forthcoming supports um, primarily related to um, MDR and implementation work. In the new year, we're going to have a series of new documents and pieces of information available that will support sponsors of studies in Ireland. Um, so we're working on updating our guide for clinical investigations for sponsors. Um, we're also working, I guess, to uh, develop the application form in Europe, and that will hopefully be the one we'll use in HPRA for applying for clinical investigations for MDR. And we'll also provide a lot of general information um, on the HPRA website um, starting in quarter one of next year. And um, finally, one thing just to mention, it's uh, just some internal work we're doing at the moment, but we're working on a pilot scheme for clinical investigations of early phase and low risk uh, software based medical devices. And this is something that will hopefully help uh, studies um, relating to those products where some of the considerations from a safety performance and regulatory perspective can be quite different. It's essentially to help facilitate those types of studies um, when they are uh, truly low risk to try and expedite and progress with um, assessments of those products. Um, so I guess that concludes the slides and I'll just hand back to James and I think we can then start the question and answer session. Uh, thanks very much Tom. Um, thanks for the excellent presentations uh, and the overview of really a lot of aspects of, of um, the clinical uh, regulation. Um, we are joined by um, Niall McAleenan, uh, the Director of Devices, who is also going to help us answer some of these questions. Um, so I might uh, pass the first question to Niall, um, and it's the question there at the bottom of the list. Niall, if, if a notified body has not been MDR designated or has not applied to be designated, uh, will their ISO 13485 certification still be valid? Um, so if a manufacturer has ISO 13485 certification from a non-designated MDR notified body, is this still valid? Well, uh, thank you, James. Um, as I would understand it, the, the 13485 certificate in itself, uh, of course, is, is still valid because it's issued by a, a notified body as, a, as an ISO certification body. Um, uh, so it would still be valid as a, as a 13485 certificate. I guess the question um, in relation to whether it is applicable for MDR, the, the, the quality system certification um, uh, under MDR is obviously specific to that regulation, so the notified body would have to be designated um, uh, to, to MDR in order to issue quality system certificates um, under MDR. Um, and obviously, need to bear in mind as well that the um, currently the, the mandate in relation to the harmonisation of standards under um, uh, under MDR and IVDR is still something that's in negotiations. So uh, the 13485 certificate in itself will remain valid, but then its applicability uh, for MDR will, will be less so. Uh, thanks very much, Niall. Thank you for that, Niall. Um, Tom, I might pass some questions to you now. Um, hopefully relatively quick fire. Um, they seem like they, you, they may be sort of uh, relatively straightforward and um, we have a question here uh, a lot of clinical effort is going on for the MDR uh, can we expect a similar amount of effort for the IVDR? I guess it, the, the effort in terms of us as a authority um, <laughs> or um, or for manufacturers um, I guess in any event there is certainly going to be further effort needed um, I guess at the CIE working group, um, we do have a work package. It's our one ongoing work package from our 2017 work program, and that's to support the IVD working group. Um, so I think there certainly will be a job of compliance uh, for manufacturers to come into IVD or compliance. Um, I guess the timelines are somewhat longer, but it is still approaching relatively quickly. Um, so I guess it is important for IBD manufacturers to um, keep an eye out for um, guidance which is being prepared and I think was talked about earlier in the week, um, as well as understanding the general process and uh, 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 change in requirements um, under IVDR. Uh, 
Thank you, Tom. Um, similar question, I suppose uh, you mentioned that the, uh, the CIE has a, a liaison with the IVD working group. Um, will the CIE work group, is it participating in the development of a PSUR PMS uh, report template? Uh, and can you speak to that at all? Um, I think this is work that's being led by the Vigilance Working Group. Um, so it's often the case that if there is a piece of work being led by one working group, um, we would sometimes reach out to the other relevant and impacted working groups. So we would often um, uh, provide comment feedback during consultation rounds or help on discrete questions. But I guess this is work that's primarily being led um, from our Vigilance Working Group colleagues. OK, thanks. Um, and uh, I think you covered this slightly, but maybe you can speak to it a bit more. There's a question here about um, whether the application templates are going to be harmonised uh, among member states um, and whether they could already be used before May 26, 2021. Um, so I'm not sure if you want to speak any more to that. Sure, yeah, no, that's a good question. And I guess one of the things we discussed last week at CIE was that, um, you know, I'm aware that the different um, application platforms in member states can be somewhat different. Um, for example, in places like the Netherlands or Austria, they have a single application online platform that covers both research ethics as well as national competent authority applications. Um, I'm happy to say that um, all member states agreed that the standalone template could be used in additional to whatever national requirements might apply. Um, I'd imagine when these guidances do come out, they will say, you know, check with your uh, local national competent authority to ensure that no other requirements apply. But I think it's good that um, all authorities in general are happy to use the standardized template that we're developing. Great, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Niall, I might might hand a question over to you here. Um, we have a question on, I think, possibly Tom's work package 16, or or uh, it's listed here as work package 16, um, and the, the comment, the state of common specifications, um, uh, how are manufacturers supposed to meet common specifications uh, that, that aren't necessarily uh, published yet? Do you have an answer for that one first, Niall? Yeah, no, I, I, I I, I I can in many respects agree with the um, w w with the question, and as much as um, we would certainly see uh, at HPRA level that the development of common specifications is something that uh, we would certainly like to see happening uh, as a priority. But I think as Tom has, has outlined uh, in his presentation, obviously you know the work package of the work program um, for the CIE working group is something that needs to be agreed across all of the different um, member state authorities that are present and, and indeed the European Commission. But we are certainly very keen um, to, uh, to to see common specifications addressed. Um, obviously, there are common specifications coming for some um, product categories, namely those in, in, in Alex 16 um, and the reprocessed single use um, medical devices. But um, uh, certainly it, it, it's something that we would agree um, is, is, is a priority for development. Um, Maybe also, James, um, I'll speak to us a, a question here, um, which is quite popular in relation to, is the MDCG working on any document to support um, the promotion or advertising um, of, of medical devices? Uh, to my knowledge, um, no, um, is, is the answer to that question as it stands. Um, there isn't a specific guidance that's being um, developed up as it, just right now. But as you can imagine, the, the MDCG and, and the different technical working groups have long lists of, 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 of activities. Uh, and I guess the, the, the focus has really been um, on trying to prioritize those activities which are absolutely necessary to have in place by, uh, by May 21 or, or May 2022 for, for, for IVDR. Uh, and, and maybe just to, to speak, um, uh, just to follow up on, on what Tom said in relation to a lot of clinical effort going on for I, for MDR. Can we expect a similar effort for IVDR? You know, I think again that there there is a joint work um, that has progressed between the IVD working group and the, the clinical working group to to look at the um, the area of of, of clinical data uh, relevant to in vitro diagnostics. And as you'll remember from uh, from our presentations on Tuesday on the IVDR, uh, that was one of the items highlighted. Um, Certainly, uh, again, like all areas, this is one where there is a prioritization exercise going on. So, uh, you know, I think there 
there will be a focus for the system on, on getting that guidance progressed. Um, so yes, similar efforts will be will be deployed. That's great, Niall. Thank you very much. Um, Tom, there's some interest in, in I think you, you mentioned it briefly on the last slide there, um, that the DHBRA is working on a, a slightly new approach or a, a moderate, a modified approach to clinical investigations um, of uh, software. Um, oh no, sorry, apologies, I've, I've read the question slightly wrong. So how would the clinical investigation application scheme um, in the HBRA a plan to risk class one to two B software B. Okay, uh, so I guess in, in general for lower risk products, um, uh, how does our process work? So I, I guess people may be aware that um, under the directive and with the regulation, um, it is a uh, option on a national level to decide whether uh, lower risk products require a clinical investigation application and assessment by the competent authority. Um, I guess it's a it's a policy approach in HPRA that we tend to review all clinical investigation applications regardless of risk class, um, but we do adopt a proportionate approach in terms of the assessment itself. Um, I guess in terms of the application form, I don't think there would be any significant difference between the different risk classes, um, but I guess depending on the product, because we have wide variance in the types of products that we uh, regulate, it could be something as simple as a piece of software to something as complex as an implantable heart valve technology. Um, so I guess what we do, um, if there are people who feel that there are aspects of the application form or compliance with standards, et cetera, you know, I guess in particular for low risk products, uh, we're happy to talk about what our expectations are in those preliminary or pre-submission meetings and to ensure that we all have a consistent approach to how the process will flow. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, thank you for that. Uh, there's a question here uh, in relation to the, the SAE reporting um, for clinical investigations under the MDR. Um, and uh, I suppose the question is specifically to um, studies, it sounds like that have been commenced under the MDD, but but after the date of application, we'll have to um, meet the, the requirements for, for SAE reporting under the MDR. Um, and uh, there's a question on how, how that will work if, if the, the study is planned to finish shortly after the date of application of the MDR. Is there any uh, provision going to be made for a transition period moving from the directives to the the SAE or to the, the uh, regulation requirements and um, for studies that are already ongoing? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. And I guess in the guidance that accompanies the SAE MedDev document, um, you'll find some detail around that and a plan for the transition period. Um, I guess if it's the case that the study is due to end very shortly after, um, I guess there would be process changes to come into MDR compliance. Um, I think as a general rule, you probably would have to bring it into MDR compliance for the template part. But I guess one of the things we thought about a lot when we developed that um, template and guide um, is that we wanted to keep it as close as possible to the prior format. Um, so people will remember that um, the current SAE approach under the directives is an Excel table with line listings per each event. So you can look at the sim single file and get an impression of the various events. Um, one of the things that was being developed for the new Udemed system was that each event was going to have a standalone document. So this would be a little bit more like the post-market vigilance approach or the mirror form of people are aware, um, the manufacturer incident report. Um, so because Udemed wasn't available, um, we decided to keep the format as similar as possible to the current directive based one as our contingency plan. Um, so hopefully the new template wouldn't be too big a transition and you'll find the uh, guidance to help you with that um, in the guidance that accompanies the SAE template. Uh, okay, thanks very much, Tom. Um, now just a follow on question. Um, there may not be a straightforward answer to it, but uh, when a common specification is released, how soon after its release uh, would manufacturers be expected to comply with it, do you think? Uh, yeah, the, normally a transition period is built in um, to, to common specifications um, as, the, as to when they're uh, directly legally applicable. Obviously, once a common specification is set, um, it, it, it's then something which, um, uh, w which gives a very good uh, idea as to exactly what criteria are going to have to be met. But normally, as I understand it, there is a transition period built in for all of them. Uh, that varies according to what the common specification uh, is. 
what the impact on the particular product group is, uh, as I would understand it. Uh, and maybe just in, in, in picking up on um, on the next question that, that I see in the list there, um, are the currently recruited expert panels able to actively perform consultation at the moment? Uh, and if not, when will they begin? Um, so uh, as I understand it, the, the expert panels should be operational um, by, by the end of this year. Um, I think Tom has uh, touched upon it in his in his presentation. Uh, as I understand it, there are um, six different technical panels um, for MTR and IVDR that are proposed um, to be, I suppose, then um, fed by a, a screening panel um, to, to look at the criteria um, for the products which may be subject to the, uh, the clinical evaluation consultation procedure or, or the corresponding in, I, in IBDR. Um, as I understand it, there are over 350 experts uh, recruited to the expert panel system um, and uh, that they are now in the process of completing training, um, which is being coordinated by the European Commission. Obviously, uh, um, all of the, the documentation, the contracts, the, um, uh, the, the, the management of uh, potential conflicts of interest and impartiality, all of those um, th things have been worked through as it stands. So from what I understand, um, the Euro European Commission are hopeful that those panels will be in place uh, by the end of this year. Uh, and also, obviously, as Tom pointed to in, in, in his presentation, um, quite significant development uh, during the course of this week, where the European Commission um, have made a proposal for, for new legislation uh, to in the long term have the expert panels um, that are envisaged uh, ultimately managed by the European Medicines Agency. Obviously that's something that's at a, a very early stage. It's a commission proposal at this point um, and as I would understand it then has to go through the, the normal legislative procedure with the European Council, uh, European Parliament etc. Uh, thanks very much for that Niall. Um, Tom, is the CIA working group uh, envisage or is it currently doing any work in relation to post-market clinical follow-up studies and, and guidance there? Um, that's a good question. Um, so I guess we have those two MDCG uh, templates that complain, or contain a little bit of guidance within them. Uh, if you read through the templates, you'll see they have sort of trigger um, or rationale for each of the kind of data entry points in the templates. Um, we don't currently have a standalone guidance planned. I know that there is a, a PMCF MedDev. Um, and again, that's just down to the limited resources and the urgent time pressures for, I guess, the system need uh, work packages that we have. Um, it is something we'd like to think about in future. Looking to update the general clinical evaluation guidance. Um, it's important to remember, though, that updating guidance of that kind is um, burdensome from both a time and resource and perspective. Uh, so we have to plan quite carefully. And we did have lots of discussions at previous CIE meetings as to how we might manage to do that. Um, I think the consensus last week from the member states was that we need to press ahead with some of the urgent system needs right now. Um, it, it's not helped, I guess, by the fact that COVID has, has presented you know, significant resource challenges for many of the people who would typically support our work at the CIE working group. And so we've had to be quite realistic, focus on the system needs and these more methodological uh, guidance documents are ones which we hopefully will make time to plan for uh, and hopefully some of that planning or scoping might start next year. Um, if I could maybe just add a very brief comment and um, just in addition to um, Niall's comment on the expert panels, um, because this had a little bit of discussion at the CIE working group um, at the plenary session last week. Um, I guess there's two types of clinical evaluation consultation or what we call scrutiny. Um, so there's um, Article 54, which is the uh, typical one that's required for uh, new and high risk products, but is also a voluntary one under Article 61.2. Um, and I guess the feedback that we um, had from the Commission last week was that it's not currently envisaged that the Article 61.2 uh, voluntary clinical evaluation consultation will be available initially. Uh, and I guess that comes down to some of the system demands uh, whereby uh, I guess they need to progress with the um, Article 54 ones as a first priority. But I guess it's hopefully one that will be further developed in time because I think that providing that kind of um, support for innovative products uh, in that voluntary sense uh, 
um, you'll see in Article 61.2, you know, the um, the kind of advice that might be given by the expert panels um, is to be given what's called due consideration. And I guess it's hopefully something that would provide facilitative guidance for new and innovative products um, from scientific experts. Um, so I see great potential, but it's not something that's going to be available um, just yet. Um, thanks very much for that, Tom. Um, and thanks, Niall, for joining our panel as well. Um, thank you, everyone, for all of the questions. That we, there are some, there's a significant number of questions and, and where we weren't answered, able to answer your question directly. As I said, we will look to um, incorporate any of those questions into ongoing um, guidance that we're, we're publishing on our website and, and on our newsletter. Um, so keep an eye on our website and, and on our newsletters for further information. Um, I'd be grateful if, uh, as with previous days, if you're able to, to fill in the feedback questionnaire um, via menti.com with that code. Um, the feedback is very useful for us as we as we tailor um, this way of interacting um, with you. Um, and, and we obviously want to make this as useful for you as possible, so um, feedback is important. Um, it only, I suppose, remains for me then to just thank everyone uh, involved in preparing for, for today and, and for this whole week. Um, so many, many thanks to Dr. Tom Melvin for the excellent overview of, of a lot of different aspects of, of the legislation. Um, I'd like to thank also our corporate events team, Gemma and Ruth, and our comms and policy team for helping with the production and, and curation of this. Um, for our IT colleagues and, and the, uh, the audiovisual company, MJ Flood. Um, and thank you for attending today. Um, we we really are grateful for your your engagement and with this process we're grateful for all the questions that are asked um, and I, I wish you all a very good weekend and stay safe thanks very much